Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today for this very special event on advocating for the Asian American community. I'm Priya Bathija, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at the American Hospital Association, and I will be your moderator for today's session. This webinar is part of AHA's Joining Hands for Greater Impact series. Over the past year, hospitals and health systems have taken on unprecedented challenges in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. This included not only treating COVID-19 patients, but also accessing personal protective equipment, ramping up testing, responding to their community social needs, and now efforts to educate and vaccinate individuals across the country. In many cases, hospitals and health systems did not do this alone. They have forged new and sometimes non-traditional partnerships to meet the needs of their patients and communities. At the AHA, we've had a front row seat to see how these relationships have formed and evolved over time. Our Joining Hands for Greater Impact series highlights how these partnerships have enabled hospitals and health systems to respond to the pandemic. Today, we're going to discuss how hospitals and community stakeholders have joined hands to address the needs of the Asian American communities they serve. It's no coincidence that we have decided to host this webinar in May which is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. This month is an opportunity to reflect on the generations of Asian Americans who have enriched America's history. It's an opportunity to celebrate the nearly 20 million Asian American individuals who are instrumental in the country's future success. And for those of us in healthcare, it is an opportunity to pause and reflect on this diverse community's health needs during the pandemic and beyond. This reflection is especially important today, given the unique challenges the Asian American community has experienced throughout the pandemic. For example, a high proportion of Asian Americans work in high contact, essential occupations in healthcare, increasing their risk for COVID-19 exposure and infection. This community has also sustained some of COVID-19's worst economic impacts. And amid those challenges, they've had to contend with an upswell of anti-Asian xenophobia and racism. At the national level, our government is taking action to protect Asian Americans. Last week, President Biden signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to combat pandemic-related hate crimes. At the local level, hospitals and community stakeholders have also stepped up to meet the needs of their Asian American communities. I'm really excited to be with some extraordinary leaders today who will discuss all of this and more. Today, we are going to have two conversations. First, we will discuss the Asian American experience during the pandemic. I will be joined by Dr. Hirsch Trivedi, who is president and CEO of Shepherd Pratt and a member of AHA's board of trustees. We'll also be joined by Juliet Choi, who is president and CEO of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum and Han Nam Kung, who is a policy advocate with the North Carolina Justice Center. Then for our second conversation, Dr. Trivedi will lead a discussion with Dr. Nadine Chang, who is a licensed clinical psychologist at Gracie Square Hospital and the assistant attending psychologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital. They'll be joined by Dr. Christine Pabico, who is the director of the Pathway to Excellence Program at the American Nurses Association. That panel will discuss the healthcare system's response and how hospitals and other stakeholders can partner to meet the needs of Asian American patients now and in the future. Then we'll bring all the speakers together so that you have an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. If you have questions at any time during today's conversation, you can enter them into the Q&A box. We promise to get to as many of them as possible. Well, we have a lot to learn from these leaders today, so let's get started. To kick things off, I'd like to invite Dr. Trivedi, Julia, and Hun to join the conversation. Welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having us. To get started, um, can each of you tell us about your organization and the community you serve? And um, maybe, Juliet, we can start with you. Sure, great. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be joining all of you today for this really important conversation. And Priya and AHA, I just want to applaud you for your leadership for convening this dialogue. Uh, my name is Juliet Choi. I'm the president and CEO of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. 
Uh, we are celebrating our 35th anniversary this year. We are the country's oldest and largest health justice advocacy organization serving the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities across the country. And in a nutshell, what that means is we have a robust, growing network of community partners across the country. We're at 150 uh, colleague organizations and growing. And at the National Federal, based here in Washington, D.C., and I am based in D.C., we also advocate and bring these types of similar conversations to three, the three branches of government, the White House Executive Branch, the Congress, and where needed with the U.S. Supreme Court. Wonderful. Um, Hun, I'll turn to you next. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for having me on today. My name is Han Nam Kung, and I work for the North Carolina Justice Center, which is a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to achieving economic security for all people in North Carolina. And this looks different in a number of ways, but we frequently use policy advocacy, community engagement, if needed litigation, and also um, just educating people on their rights um, as it relates to different areas of the law. And I work very specifically in health issues. Um, and so I work a lot around health advocacy for people who are low income. Awesome, and Dr. Trevedi. So I'm Hirsch Trevedi, President and CEO for Shepherd Pratt. Uh, our, my organization is, uh, Yes, uh, a, a hospital system, but I will say more importantly for this conversation, 387 sites that are deep in communities across the state of Maryland. Uh, we take care of people uh, without insurance, uh, on public uh, sector insurance, and a number of people. Uh, we have clinics that take, for, take care of people that speak 52 different languages. And so I think particularly for this conversation, what I'd say is what I'm most proud of is during COVID, we've distributed over 150,000 diapers. We have provided over half a million meals. We've had people going into homes to make sure that uh, people are safe or getting the right information. I think very much uh, this is a really important conversation to have. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so thankful to have all of you here today. Um, so we know the AAPI community has faced a number of challenges throughout the pandemic. I listed some of them um, sort of in my introductory remarks. Juliet, can you share more about these unique challenges that the AAPI community has faced during the pandemic and what your organization is doing to address them? Sure, so uh, COVID uh, has just been a devastating pandemic for all of our communities and particularly for communities of color. For the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities, I do want to underscore and highlight, I think a lot of uh, folks that are joining us today can appreciate this to some varying degrees. Even before the pandemic, our communities always face a challenge of this notion of invisibility. Um, so we all know that data matters and that words matter. Um, and I think the COVID conversation really has brought to the fore why data is so important, but particularly for the AA and HPI community. If we don't have good data systems to capture, understand, underscore what we're experiencing, we will always be invisible to the solutions, to the approaches to address the unmet needs, but also to be able to highlight the resiliency of our communities. I think the added challenge also is because of the diversity and the vibrancy of our communities, language access and overcoming that language barrier has always classically been a challenge. I think in COVID it's been extraordinarily underscored. If you're like me, starting from day one, anytime we received life impacting public health guidance, it always took me a couple of takes to understand what kind of information be, was being communi communicated to the public. And if you can imagine the language barrier and not having the critical public health information available in the languages our communities need, that has been an extraordinarily uh, extraordinary challenge. I think the last thing I'll underscore, and I know we'll have a little bit more time to cover this, is that in this last year, our country uh, has really 
faced a watershed moment when it comes to racial reckoning. Mm -hmm. um, centering Black lives and also with our communities, unfortunately, regrettably, but it's a report, it's, it's a repeat of history. We have encountered a tremendous surge in anti-Asian violence. And so when you combine the impact of COVID and anti-Asian violence, literally we are left with families who have had COVID vaccination appointments, who have shuttered in and are forgoing the care that they deserve and that they need. And that's hard to sort of hear and imagine that they would not feel comfortable going to get their vaccine appointments. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about how we can address that later. Um, Hirsch, can you specify, specifically speak to sort of the mental health implications of anti-Asian hate and other stressors that have occurred during the pandemic? Sure, you know, I, I think one of the big things that I will say is um, the, the community that we're talking about, the, there are people that are, I will say, very much interested in how do they give back to the broader community. Uh, many members of our society are in healthcare. And uh, having been in some of these panels, what stands out to me is if I'm talking to a Filipino nurse or I'm talking to an Indian physician, when you hear about the experience that they've had before you even get to the hate issues, just being at the front line of taking care of people that have COVID, we have an entire large portion of our population that have been traumatized by what they've seen and gone through. And I think particularly, you know, on the one hand, we say, well, it's great, we've got a vaccine, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But when you talk about mental health, the issue is people have been fighting for the last 12 to 15 months to get through. When you actually see the light at the end of the tunnel, is when your body gives out, it's when all of a sudden everything hits you. And so we're seeing that in healthcare right now. The part that's really hard to comprehend is when you add on to that, all of the hate related, bias related, all of those events, uh, here you have, you've risked your life day in and day out to help, or you may be in an economic position where you had no choice but to go to work. And so you've been on that front line. And now what happens is uh, you see things on the news. You see someone randomly getting punched on the street. You see someone ending up in the hospital. You see all of the, I will say, racial comments and everything else that are flowing. And what it causes is true just paranoia, isolation. And then you have to put that into a cultural context, right? So these communities that we're talking about, they are very much multi-generational. They are very much connected in deep-rooted family bonds. And when you think about, you know, our uh, elderly parents uh, have to stay away from their children or their grandchildren because it's not safe and we might give them COVID. You have a ton of isolation, you have depression, you have anxiety, really a fear for what's gonna come next. And then on top of all that, the last comment I'll make is, the problem is also in our community, just like the black and brown community, there's this overwhelming belief that, well, mental health issues don't happen within our community. So there isn't a willingness to talk about it. And even if you do, it's really hard to find therapists and uh, providers that understand culturally where you're coming from or being able to help or even look like you. So I think it's all of that mixed in together. Yeah, and Hirsch, you touched on a lot of cultural issues, um, but in the Asian American community or the AAPI community, or there are a number of different acronyms you can use to categorize this, this community, it, it's a big group. It includes a lot of people from many different countries with many different cultures. And sure, there are some common threads between um, the two. I think the intergenerational family is a common thread that we see throughout Asian Americans. Um, but can you shed some light on some of the examples of how experiences during the pandemic may have differed in the greater a AAPI community? Um, Juliet, maybe you can start from a national perspective on what you're seeing. Sure. So you're absolutely right, given the diversity of our communities. Um, I think 
if, if we can try to picture a family, um, you know, I, I, we, we've heard from the good work of some of our local partners, for example, in the earlier days of uh, the availability of COVID vaccinations, for example, in Southern California, where the first wave of those who were eligible to receive the vaccinations, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities, uh, there was a uh, very low uptake for vaccinations. And it was only through conversations that there was the realization when the age threshold was set initially as a priority of those who are 75 and older could receive the vaccination, we learned that uh, unfortunately, there is a uh, smaller population that are 75 and over in the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community. Um, you have elders in the community, but it's a smaller population at 75 and over. So it did take one of our uh, one of our local partners on the ground that did a tremendous amount of, as you can imagine negotiations and explanations uh, with, with the public health officials to modify that threshold so that the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community in that location would be eligible for the vaccination. Um, I think in other places, for example, you've all highlighted how different parts of our communities do live in multi-generational households whether those are urban centers like New York City or in rural areas closer to meatpacking and agricultural locations. And what we learned is that when you are in multi-generational households, this is the working hard, the working poor, however way you wanna describe it, those families are not necessarily connected to a local community organization. So in terms of getting the information out for social distancing and good uh, hand washing practices, that information was not getting out into our community in the early many, many months. Um, fast forward, I think right now, what we are really seeing and one of the interventions we've created is that now that vaccines are more widely available, we are hearing that because our community is largely an immigrant community, that they are facing uh, unnecessary questioning and requirements to pr provide proof of insurance or identification. And we all know in this community, that is not a requirement. So to counter those kinds of elements, and, and I'm sure Hun is doing a lot of this work in North Carolina as well, we at the Health Forum, just this week, we are releasing a Know Your Rights series of fact sheets and making that available in 25 Asian Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander languages. Thanks, Julia. And Han, I, I would love to hear what you are seeing in North Carolina and some of the work that you've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, to speak to Juliet's and Hirsch's points, um, we are a really large community and being part of a large community means that it can disguise um, a lot of the disparities that exist um, within our own community and just the different kinds of experiences and needs that people have. And so for an example, um, talking about insurance status. Insurance status can vary very much um, within um, the AA, AAPI community in North Carolina. You can have a lot of folks who rely on Medicaid. You can have folks who can't rely on Medicaid because of immigration status or income levels. People who own um, small businesses and who are uninsured because they can't afford insurance coverage. Um, folks who rely on private insurance um, or people who rely um, are able to access insurance through employers. Um, insurance coverage can just vary tremendously um, within the community, which has a lot of implications for how people are able to access treatment um, and healthcare information. Um, related to that as well, socioeconomic status is very different as well. And so, um, that just means that people are exposed to COVID-19 infection um, in different ways. Um, and so, you know, the way that we have seen that play out just across the country is, is 
what we have seen as well for um, the Asian American context. And then, um, you know, just the health needs are very different too um, within the community and how that can exacerbate risk of COVID infection or serious COVID infection um, can be very different as well. So those, all of those um, things we, have, we are seeing um, within North Carolina um, too. Thanks, Han. And I know your organization, and in fact, all of your organizations, as well as the AHA, is doing a lot to improve vaccine confidence. Um, so can you all tell us a little bit about how you're working to do that and to combat some of the misinformation that is out there about vaccines? Um, Han, maybe you can go first, and then I'll turn to Hirsch and Julia. Sure. Um, we know that you know a lot of people, especially immigrants, have um, experienced a lot of anxiety in the last administration because of a lot of the harmful rhetoric that was um, caused by the Trump administration. And uh, what we saw a lot around um, public charge. And so um, our organization took a lot of efforts to create fact sheets that were related to immigrants and their rights around being able to access the vaccine. And so we just made it very simple, easy to understand, infographic style um, that would be able to, uh, to you know, educate folks on what their rights are, um, how their information would be kept confidential, ways that they could access the vaccine. And um, we made it available in uh, several uh, languages. Um, including Burmese, um, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, and some other ones that I am forgetting right now. That's okay, there's a lot of them. Um, as Juliet said, theirs are coming out in 25 different languages, which really does, does speak to the vastness of the populations that are included in this, this category of Asian American. Um, Han, did you, in addition to creating the graphics, do anything on the ground with your communities to actually educate or have conversations with them? Or is that something that really didn't happen because of our the nature of COVID and being more socially isolated? Sure, thank you for that question. It, it is really hard. Um, we weren't really able to do things on the ground, but I think that we have a really excellent uh, VHHS and they took efforts to hold um, vaccination efforts in areas where members of our community frequent. So um, for example, a local mosque um, where you know, they really try to reach out to um, members of our community, which I think was really good. That, that's good to hear. Um, Hirsch, maybe I'll turn to you to talk about your efforts on vaccine confidence at Shepherd Pratt. Yeah, so you know, the, the big thing I would say is um, we have this tendency where we say, well, how does an entire group think about something, whether it's the BIPOC community or the AAPI community? I think what we've learned really is that uh, at the end of the day, people are human beings and uh, no two, uh, three or four brown people have the same perspective or AAPI people have the same perspective. And so for us, what we realized is in your first go around, you're going to get a good number of people who are likely to get vaccinated, take it. And then after that, you really have to figure out how do you uh, specify the message. But then after that, uh, it really is a lot of handholding, being able to figure out, well, what, what is that thing that is in the way? And we found things like, number one, it's, it's as simple as they want to do it, but there is no transportation or way to get to where the vaccine's being given. So we actually stood up pop-up clinics in different neighborhoods across the state uh, where we were able to provide uh, vaccinations closer to where people lived. Uh, the second thing I would say is uh, we have incredible caregivers who really would just go up to someone and start the conversation and then just really try to kind of get to an understanding of, well, what is it that you don't understand? And it, it's misinformation or not understanding what the vaccine does, or you know, the, the vaccine has something live in it that's gonna get you sick. And there are all these things. And unless you actually can have that conversation, it's hard to get it to that other side. Um, and then I think that the last thing that I'll say within kind of strategies are, uh, who are the people that really have influence? And so we, we've made these videos uh, where we just simply go through what is the, uh, our workforce, which represents people from all backgrounds and nationalities and people speaking different languages. We've made videos where people just 
they talk about their why. Why was it important for them to get the vaccine? And if you can see someone that looks like you, sounds like you, uh, and is sharing a lot of the things that, that would be important to you, all of a sudden you think, well, maybe I should consider getting this. And, and many times it's, I'm doing this to see my grandchild, or because I did this, I can visit my grandmother who had leukemia or has some kind of other medical issue going on. And that's particularly huge within the AAPI community. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that resonates a lot with me and sort of my family. Um, Juliet, we have a couple minutes left, so I'll just turn to you and maybe you can share at a national level what you've been working on related to vaccine confidence. Sure. So, I mean, I, I would just say the, the power of partnerships and networks. Um, and so at the Health Forum through this COVID pandemic, we uh, launched last year with a network of 24 and growing national and local organizations. Uh, and we're called the National AANHPI Health Response Partnership. Uh, say that 10 times fast. <laughs> Uh, very happy to share uh, our website link, but really the power of partnerships, um, a lot of what, um, you know, uh, everyone has already stated, it's, it's really leveraging those trusted messengers, but through the power of partnerships, I also want to underscore, you know, even this dialogue today is, are there shared campaigns, community campaigns, where we can connect up with one another? Um, I call it the inside out, outside in approach, right? So we're doing what we can within the AA and HPI community, but it's important for us to also partner with, for example, and support what HHS is doing with the We Can Do This campaign, for example, or the Made to Save campaign. Um, but through the partnerships at its core, this is overcoming the language barriers making sure that information is really culturally relevant, family to family, neighbor to neighbor, and to boost the confidence rate for those that have not sought their vaccine um, vaccination, I would put them in two broad categories. One is it's an issue of trust or the perception of risk or an access issue. Uh, so those who've never received their vaccination, right? And this is, again, where those trusted messengers, it's not going to be government. It's going to be your doctor. It's going to be your faith-based leader. It's going to be your senior or your elder or someone within your family. The other category to underscore what Han stated is that while we uh, are working closely in partnership with this White House, I don't think we can underscore and minimize the impact of the anti-immigrant agenda of the last four years. Um, so these are individuals who attempted to get healthcare either in the past or in the COVID context, but out of fear of immigration status, had a bad experience. And if you have a bad experience, it is really hard to overcome the language the culture and say, you know what, as, as of today, you should step forward and everything is gonna be okay. That is a really tough message to deliver. And so again, it's that power of partnerships and networking and trusted messengers that's going to help us get through to the finish line, but also in a much broader context for achieving health equity, which you know I, I think is what, what is at our collective core mission here. Yes, I, I agree. I think that it, that it that is most definitely our core mission, and I am thankful that you brought up this concept of collaboration because it really dovetails nicely into the second discussion that we're going to have now. Um, so thank you both for being with us, and um, Dr. Trevedi, I will hand it over to you to lead the next discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome Dr. Chang and Dr. Pabico for uh, to the second panel. And as they uh, come on, I guess what, what we'd like to talk about is the healthcare community's response to API needs during the pandemic and beyond. Uh, so maybe what we can do is, uh, could we start with each one of you uh, telling us a little bit about your organization and the community that you serve? Dr. Rubico, why don't you go first? 
Great, thank you so much, Dr. Trivedi. Um, you know, as you said, um, I work at the American Nurses Association and the American Nurses Credentialing Center. And the, pro the program that I lead uh, provides a framework to guide organizations to create positive practice environment for healthcare givers. And, you know, even before the pandemic, there's already been increasing rates of burnout uh, being reported among nurses. And as you can imagine, uh, this has been exacerbated, you know, by the pandemic, which makes our work even more critical. And as you said earlier, Dr. Trevedi, um, you know, the day-to-day -day stress that frontline uh, caregivers, you know, have gone through, we don't even know what the specific long-term effects, you know, are going to be. So creating a positive practice environment it is, is extremely important to us. And we actually refer to it as the other PPE because we think that it's just as essential in safeguarding clinicians. Um, and then in addition to my role at um, ANCC and ANA, I'm also the president elect for the Metropolitan DC chapter of the Philippine Nurses Association. So some of the things that you might hear me share today are specific to what we're seeing and hearing from this community. Wonderful, thank, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Chang? Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Nadine Chang. I'm a clinical psychologist at Gracie Square Hospital, which is a freestanding inpatient psychiatric hospital that's part of the New York Presbyterian hospital system. So we are quite a large hospital system um, that is located all over the New York metropolitan area and Westchester and Hudson Valley. Um, so Thankfully, we, we are able to provide services to you know, quite a large number of people. Um, I will say also that at, at my hospital, Gracie Square Hospital, we have an Asian psychiatry program, which is a program designed to provide inpatient psychiatric services to AAPI um, individuals needing inpatient psychiatric care. And I'm the chair of this committee, and part of what we do as, as the committee is we do a lot of community outreach um, to the Asian communities in New York City. So I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. I, I, I'm excited to uh, learn what you're all about to uh, speak about. You know, I, I will say uh, we've all seen COVID-related inequities in terms of uh, in the communities that we are involved in. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about kind of uh, what you've noticed and specifically, I guess, what, what has your organization done to address them? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Cheng. You, you just mentioned outreach. I guess, what is NYP's strategy uh, for API outreach during this pandemic? Absolutely. And um, I can speak for NYP more broadly, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we've done at Gracie Square Hospital. Um, but NYP has sort of taken, gone from the inside out. And so within our hospital system, there's an enterprise wide emphasis on respect, diversity, equity, inclusion, and really to um, incorporate this into all employees sort of day to day, you know, mentality. And, you know, our employees are community facing. And so, you know, reflecting this back to the community. So in addition to that, we do have community affairs outreach, um, an outreach program where, you know, we collaborate with community organizations to provide education and resources. So, you know, I, I think, um, and this is, I think, has really ramped up over the last year, year and a half. Um, and we've been able to work with our chambers of commerce to provide PPE. Um, to organizations, community organizations. We host town halls, we host um, workshops, a lot of, a lot of community lectures. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty busy, um, but grateful that we are able to reach so many people. Um, and in terms of mental health, you know, someone you know, alluded to this earlier that the mental health toll of the pandemic has been quite significant. Um, and so we do provide um, uh, lectures on just on mental health 101 um, in a variety of uh, Asian languages. Thankfully, here at Gracie Square, we have um, a pretty dedicated team, um, interdisciplinary team, I will say, of social workers, nurses, and, and psychologists and psychiatrists um, who do provide these workshops in, in other languages. And, and it's sort of like, you know, an open forum where attendees can ask any questions and, and, and it's almost like a, a meet the experts kind of um, opportunity where they can ask the psychiatrist about, you know, so-and-so. So, -and -so. so um, there, there are many arms to this, 
but it's it's been very rewarding to be able to provide this. Oh, definitely. And, and you know, I, I think that that part that you said is particularly huge because it, it really is a pretty diverse community. I think one of the things that we found is uh, keeping track of data. Uh, what you find is really, uh, that's actually probably one of the things that's been hardest throughout COVID is uh, whether it's supply of PPE, who's been vaccinated. It really is can we get granular with the data to figure out what strategies are working, but more importantly, where do we need to do more? And I think that, that that's been one of the key themes really from this COVID experience that's important. Um, so the next question I would say is, uh, you know, what have you seen as the greatest challenges for the API community during COVID? And, and what about assets? And so maybe uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Kapika. Yes. Um, you know, so the pandemic has definitely exacerbated um, already existing challenges that were being experienced by the AAPI community. And several of the things, you know, like language barrier, which Dr. Choi mentioned earlier, uh, limited understanding of information being shared, or even identifying credible resources for information have posed significant, you know, significant challenges in educating the community. Um, I've had to either correct or offer clarification on many occasions regarding information that my own family have gotten in social media. Um, that has pretty much become their number one source of information because they don't even have to look for it. It just pops up, right? You know, so um, there's been a lot of work uh, around that as well. And, you know, the reality is even we in healthcare have been very frustrated with the rapidly changing and you know sometimes even conflicting information so just think about the community at large um, how confusing all of this is and especially for a population with additional challenges to begin with and you know these same challenges have also impacted you know their ability or willingness to access healthcare yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, this is kind of one of the issues is that uh, there were health disparities, there were problems with access before COVID. Mm -hmm. and I think just because of the nature of COVID, it's just gotten so much worse and so much more difficult to overcome the barriers. D Dr. Chang, what are your thoughts? Um, I can echo everything that Dr. Fabia just said and be sure to include mental health in, in all of those issues. And I think one added thing um, that we that we face every day is not only is it you know uh, limited knowledge and access to resources, but then you add on the stigma of mental health and mental illness. That's an additional obstacle to people receiving services. Um, so yeah, we're seeing this we're seeing this throughout, and and that's really what did sort of spawn you know the community outreach um, uh, seminars that we provide was was just for that, we will come to you and give you some information and really normalize it and normalize stress and anxiety and, you know, um, depression and, you know, present it in a way that's a little more tangible and a little more um, tolerable <laughs> within that context of, you know, stigma. Sure, and, uh, yeah, oh, go, go ahead. And if I just may add as well, you know, especially with nurses and especially Filipino nurses, um, you know, as mentioned earlier, this community that, you know, I belong to have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, it's not unusual for Filipino families to have multiple nurses, you know, working on the front line. So sometimes, you know, it could be both the husband and the wife, uh, especially with the ongoing nature of the pandemic and the multiple surges that we've seen. This has been, you know, a year and a half. Um, this definitely has been uh, very challenging for those families. And I, I'm pretty sure that many of you are familiar with the statistics as well, that you know Filipinos uh, might make up for 4% of the nursing workforce in the US. However, you know we do make up a third of the fallen heroes. And if you look at certain states like New York and California with a larger population of Filipinos, um, those statistics are even more alarming. No, I mean, definitely right on in terms of, uh, I think, where, where a lot of the focus has to be going. Uh, you know, when, when I think about this particular issue, um, what's amazing to me is I think also within our communities, people don't really know what PTSD is. They don't know what kind of what to do with that. And then because there's this perception of, well, you know, we don't have mental health problems in our community, 
uh, what I've actually noticed a lot more is just the, the increase in alcohol use, relying on substances. And we're actually seeing a lot more in that realm in terms of people that maybe have been sober for 15, 20 years, all of a sudden having trouble again with alcohol or using other substances. And so to, to me, what it talks about is really people are having difficulty coping with things that are above and beyond what we've seen. And I, I think particularly in kids, even if your mom is not the Filipino nurse, but that's, that's an auntie in your community and that person got sick or died, as a child, you're gonna worry the same thing's gonna to happen to one of your parents. And I think we're also seeing that vicarious re-traumatization also going on, which has been huge. So tell me a little bit about how you're engaging API communities specifically regarding vaccine confidence and access. What strategies seem to be working well? Um, Nadine, uh, I guess, uh, tell me a little bit about you, your experience there in New York with NYP and as well as specifically within the API community. Absolutely. Um, so we've provided um, recordings and lectures about uh, the COVID vaccine and addressing vaccine hesitancy in a variety of Asian languages um, and also have um, printed materials as well, which are updated continuously, we do have a um, Center for Health Justice now whose mission is actually to reduce those you know, inequalities that we're seeing um, in general with healthcare. Um, but that is something that they that sort of, you know, they've, they've taken on was to really be the ones to provide this up-to-date information. Um, and uh, specifically, you know, we, as we're providing these community lectures, we're, we're trying to get a feel of what the concerns are and really tailoring these presentations to what are the questions, right? We're not just saying, okay, this is you know, information about the vaccine and this is why it's good, right? But you know, I really liked, someone mm -hmm. earlier was talking about um, this, this video about um, each person saying in a different language why they took the vaccine. And that's really something um, that's, that's very powerful, I think. Um, and so we're really trying to answer the questions that the communities are asking in, in our community outreach. No, the, the, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, the, the thing that sticks out to me is, you know, we, we have this, uh, I, I will say, uh, very strong and supportive uh, hospital community. We have so many healthcare professionals, uh, A in general, but also B within the API community. And I guess, what, what, what can these folks be doing to support the API community during the pandemic and the future? Uh, and I think, you know, definitely on the mental health piece, uh, while infections may be down, I think we're only starting to see the beginning of what is kind of the tsunami of mental health effects of COVID just begin. Uh, I guess, Christine, what do you see as a role for nurses in this space? I think nurses have a um, role in educating, you know, people. Um, and, and if I can just piggyback to, to what, you know, Nadine just said, I mean, I can echo every single thing that she says, because I think it has to start with the listening. You know, I think, you know, all of us want to share the science, right? But, you know, they're not going to be ready to listen unless, you know, we can um, address some of the fears that they have. Um, and in fact, you know, even with the vaccine hesitation, a lot of the things that, you know, I do is, you know, start out by asking them, what are the fears that you have? You know, um, I know all of us, our role is to make sure that, you know, they get the vaccine at the end of the day. But, you know, I tell them that my role is here to listen to you and to address the concerns that you have. And hopefully they can make um, the best decisions for themselves and their family. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to, you know, AAPI, um, you know, the violence against the AEPI community, nurses can also play an important role in educating. You know, first, I think about our own biases. You know, we all have it or had it. And what's important is to acknowledge and continue to work on it. And then second is to educate the public about early reporting when they witness or experience something, because so many of the bias incidences, uh, which usually escalate to hate crimes, go unreported. Uh, then finally, nurses can also provide support um, to those that have been victimized. Uh, regardless of the nationality or ability to speak, uh, victims should have access to support services and know that we are here to be a part of their healing. And then, you know, also as organizations, you know, I think they have an important role to play. 
because you know employees have reported being subjected to racist remarks at work, um, notified their managers, and received no action, you know, in response. So I do think it's important to challenge um, current systems and structures to ensure that you know such inappropriate behaviors do not go unchecked and you know swept under the rug. We must uh, stand in solidarity against these types of behaviors. No, definitely true, and I think that that's probably one of the biggest things is that I think culturally it's just so against the grain to speak up mm -hmm. that when those microaggressions happen or when actually physical violence or other things happen, oftentimes we just see people kind of stay quiet or just kind of go back into their homes. And it just, uh, that, that is something that we need to change. Uh, I want to thank both of you for uh, sharing so much expertise and wonderful tips uh, as well. I want to invite back uh, Priya and all of our panelists, and uh, we look forward to some great conversation and discussion uh, from everyone in the audience. Priya? Thank you, and thank you all for that great discussion. Um, I'm learning so much from listening to all of you, and I, I am sure that all of our attendees are as well. Um, so now that I have you all back, um, we do have a couple questions that have come into the chat. Um, and the first one is related to how can hospitals take a closer look at language access and creating an inclusive environment for Asian Americans? Um, is there a framework? Is there a checklist? So maybe I'll start with our hospital speakers to take that one first and then um, can turn to others of how maybe you're working to help hospitals in your community. So um, Nadine or Hirsch? Sure, I mean, I can say, you know, like I said, we do have an Asian psychiatry program, at, um, which really, you know, I, I get the question a lot of, well, how is this different from, you know, we have all these specialized programs at our hospital, how is this one different? And it's really incorporating culture and cultural beliefs, which, yes, I will say we do this for, we try to do this for every patient, um, but specifically within the Asian psychiatry program, you know, we work a lot with families um, and, uh, pride ourselves on our multilingual staff, um, but also obviously we can't, you know, we were saying how heterogeneous this, this community is, right? So we do actually have a video interpreter service um, and it's basically an iPad on wheels that we can bring around and we just touch the language that we're looking for. And there's a video interpreter, which really goes a long, a long way for those of us who've used telephonic interpreters. Uh, which is sort of complicated. Um, and, you know, as we, you know, we work in treatment teams. And so as we're working with each individual patient, we really try to understand, you know, how their culture plays a role um, in what they're experiencing and how they're perceiving their, their treatment, which is different for, for everyone, as we know. I, I, all fantastic answers. The, the things that I would add are, I think, you know, uh, you walk into any hospital and, you know, you, you'll have like the 15 versions of the financial, like, what do you sign before you get into the hospital? Uh, part of this is, you know, depending on uh, where, which community you're in, it's really making sure that that same level of information exists for treatments and conditions. And, you know, can, can are there things that are available uh, video conference service is, is great also, but I, I would also just say similar to the questions we ask when we're talking about racial equity and, and the BIPOC population is really, if we're in a particular committee that has a community that has a certain uh, makeup in terms of AAPI members, how much does that staff look like uh, the broader community? Are there people that are already working that speak the language so you're not having to always rely on the video uh, conferencing phone uh, to make things happen. And then I think there are, I, I will say, listening to what, what people need. And so what I will say is there's a difference, for example, in an outpatient visit, who's going to come with the patient looks very different within AAPI families as opposed to uh, other visits. And so do you have enough chairs in the room? And have you made it so that for the right portions, someone's gonna leave the room so you can have some of that conversation that you need. I think it's really thinking about what each person needs and then really building a system that delivers that uh, in a very personalized way is huge. That, that's wonderful. And Hun and Juliet wanna give you a chance to, to offer any advice on creating this inclusive environment for Asian American communities. So um, 
maybe Han, that'll let us know. Sure. I mean, you know, I, I really love what Hirsch just said, just about having chairs, enough chairs. And I, I, I mean, I think that really speaks to what other panelists have said, just sort of the multi-generational aspect of um, Asian American families. You know, one thing that comes to mind, and this might sound crazy, but I think for anyone who identifies as AAPI and can understand is food. And um, I'm thinking about food and hospitals. And, you know, I had a hospital stay and it was inedible. Um, and I think for, uh, you know, uh, um, Asian American cultures, uh, it, food is just very central to our health and well-being and recovery. It's a lot of, it's, it's one of the key ways that um, we show love and how we're caring for people. And so I'm, you know, I don't really know in what ways exactly the hospitals could do something to improve food um, <laughs> and what's being offered because I, I know when I stayed I looked at the menu and I thought you know Philly cheesesteak french fries this is crazy like I you know I need some wholesome um food that has some seaweed and kelp in it um this is not gonna work for me so um that's just one suggestion I would have wonderful and Juliet Sure. No, thanks so much for that. So, you know, we just we just finished the 2020 census. I, I, another element to underscore is that the Asian American community is the fastest growing racial ethnic demographic. Um, we are at about about 7% of the country's population, but by 2030, one in 14 will be Asian American. So that, that's the backdrop that I wanna highlight in terms of creating an environment that's more inclusive. I would say, you know, following your lead Priya, I do think leadership matters. Um, so if you're a hospital plan or a facility, having some type of leadership advisory group, either internally or where you bring in community partners and you share that kind of community relationship and bring that cultural expertise and sense of inclusivity, uh, I think that speaks volumes. On language access, I do wanna say, my, my short statement on that, and some of you may know, uh, I, was, I formally served in the Office for Civil Rights at HHS during the Obama administration. So when it comes to language access, I wanna say, have a plan. If you don't have a plan, make a plan. If you don't have one, figuring out language accessibility in the middle of a crisis is probably uh, not optimal. Uh, so have a comprehensive language access plan, how you're going to tackle that soup to nuts. I know a lot of your audience already does that really, really well, but uh, have the plan, build upon it, iterate upon it, that way you can respond and you will be ready. Thanks, Julia, I think that that is a really great point to make, especially to the healthcare leaders that are listening today. Um, I saw that Aisha put some resources in the chat box. So for those of you that are attending and want to um, look at some of the resources that Juliet and others have referenced on this call, they are in the chat box now. Um, we have a question for Christine and Nadine. Um, there has been an immense advocacy from the younger first generation Asian and Filipino Americans across the United States, um, especially lately. Um, what is your advice for those younger people and how can we sustain the movement for advocating for the AAPI community in the field of healthcare and personally within our families? And maybe Christine, I can start with you and then hear from Nadine. Sure. And, you know, there's actually a lot of advocacy happening, you know, in the younger generation, which is great. You know, I was just invited to another panel, you know, a couple of weeks ago um, in Seattle. And one of the things that, you know, was brought up in that conversation and, you know, I left them with was, you know, they talked about the stereotypes, you know, that um, Filipinos and Asians have being subservient and things like that. And I said, do not let the stereotypes define who you are, you know, and um, I said, 
and I talk a lot about empowerment and having a voice because you know that's what we foster, um, especially at ANCC. But I think that's really important, you know, especially for the younger younger generation. Um, as we said early earlier, many of the microaggressions and you know uh, bias incidents occur, and nothing gets reported. You know, I think one way for us to be able to stop what's happening now is to actually, you know, speak up and, you know, um, say something. Great, Nadine. I totally agree, as always, with Dr. Pavico. <laughs> um, but I think one thing I'll add is what what we've been seeing in our community outreach is is these, you know, groups of intergenerational families, including younger people, right, who are asking, what can we do? Right, and I, we might respond to, uh, and you know, as a grandmother a little differently than we would a, a college student. Um, but information that we provided um, was about, you know, the I don't, I don't know if everybody knows this, but the New York Police Department recently developed a task force specific for addressing anti-Asian hate. Um, and so we provided those resources and, and really step by step, because a lot of the questions we were receiving were sort of practical questions of, you know, okay, I want to, you know, join in on the advocacy, what can I do? What, what do I say? Where do I go? And so we provided information about those organizations, how to report um, anti-Asian crime. If you're a witness to a crime, what do you do? What can you do? So I really think you know, providing education and resources about these sort of more practical steps really goes a long way. Um, and the last thing I wanted to include also is just the sense of community, you know, um, and really encouraging people. And, and if anything that the pandemic has provided is, you know, these, this opportunity for all of us to come together in a much more, you know, easy, feasible way uh, to communicate. <laughs> Yeah, no, and I like that you went to a bright spot from this pandemic and this time and where we are today. And if all of you would humor me, I would love to give each of you 30 seconds to talk about what you think is the biggest bright spot of what has happened from the COVID-19 the COVID pandemic, where we are today, and what sort of potential we have as we advocate for the Asian American community as we move forward. Um, and maybe not to put anyone on the spot. I'll start with Christine. Sure, and I think for me, the increased collaboration, you know, um, has been definitely a bright spot. Um, even working at the American or, um, Nurses Association, you know, there's been increased collaboration with AONL, with AHA, you know, other um, associations, and even with the local chapters and the national chapters of my own Philippine Association. So that's definitely a bright spot. Awesome, and Hirsch? You know, I, I, I would say the bright spot for me is that adversity really does bring out the best in people. And, you know, wh while we've spoken about what's not going well, there are so many amazing things that have happened. Our teams coming together, you know, the miracles of people walking out of the hospital after, you know, their COVID has been resolved, uh, families getting together. I remember early on, you know, not being able to visit uh, an elderly uh, uh, parent, and then now all of a sudden you see people are able to meet again. Uh, we're, we're at the point where we can get back to so many things that we all are, are so yearning to do, including meeting in person as opposed to having these virtual meetings. And I, I see all of that as really, uh, we're, we're getting to see what human beings can get done working together and working for the greater good. Wonderful. Um, Han? Sure. I mean, I, I think um, the bright spot is really unity and advocacy in the face of hate and adversity, like so many folks are saying. Um, just really seeing a moment for our community to work together um, and to push for even greater changes as, as we come out of this pandemic, I think is what is really exciting. Yeah. And Nadine? Um, I think a big thing is just um, resilience. You know, sh we've, we're showing ourselves resilience. And I think too often we don't give ourselves credit for what, what we go through and being able to, you know, look from the other side. And one thing I always like to highlight within resilience is creativity, because we have had to be creative about how we solve problems, how we treat patients, how we, you know, how we connect with grandma, 
you know, teaching her how to Zoom, you know, <laughs> over the phone. Um, and so it's, I think it really brings out, you know, our, our creative nature and, and that's a testament to our resilience. Yep. And Juliet, last words. Sure. Well, I started out uh, raising the concern of this notion of invisibility for our communities and words matter. And I want to say with, with the community voice and the culture voice, um, we have influenced this White House where there's there's now an executive in order, a statement denouncing xenophobia. And that has carried over to the halls of Congress where very historically, just, just the other week, the president signed into law a COVID-19 uh, hate crimes act. Um, and so that to me actually uh, gives me a lot of hope because it, it, it really concretizes that our communities are no longer invisible and that each and every one of us matters. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all of you. You have been wonderful speakers and I really appreciated all of the insights and experiences that you have shared. And I'm so proud to be part of this AAPI community with you um, and to have all of you advocating for our communities. Um, I hope this will just be the beginning of our conversations about how we, we as a healthcare system can better support the health and well-being of the Asian American community. Um, thank you all who joined and for staying an extra few minutes so that we could wrap up our conversation. Um, as many of you may know, the CDC, um, AHA was awarded a CDC grant that furthers our work helping hospitals and health systems um, build trust around the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, we have a website that includes many resources in many languages that will allow you to support your Asian American communities. Um, you can find it all at aha.org slash vaccine confidence. Um, this, this webinar itself, the video of it will be um, on our landing page for the Joining Hands for Greater Impact um, series um, by the end of the week. And we will also send it to all of you via email following the event. Um, thank you again for being with us today and have a great day.